sorry. So welcome to the money game. Uh, we're very excited to have you here. This workshop is all about learning the rules, the players and the strategies to master your money and achieve your money goals. And we've had a lot of fun writing this workshop in the last week or so. And we're going to start immediately with a question. We would love to know, how do you cope with an unexpected emergency. So Katie has a poll. Uh, and if you're watching on YouTube, please scan the QR code and vote in the poll there. But how do you cope with an unexpected emergency? Do you use savings? Do you make extra money? Or do you stick it on the credit card if everything goes wrong? Uh, how do you actually do that? And do you think you're different to the general public who is out there? Uh, do we think the people on this call are different? It's quite interesting. So please do it. At the moment, we've got 15% uh, saying they'll borrow, 15% saying they'd make extra money, 70% uh, saying that they would use savings. I think we have an unusual bunch here. We definitely have an unusual bunch. You'd hope so, having come on a workshop about money. If you're on YouTube, please... Uh, fill that out as well because it helps us to understand the people that are coming along. Uh, G Wife in the chat says they use the emergency fund, which we love. You've got an emergency fund. We will come on to that. So the poll results about 70% use savings, 17% uh, say extra money, and 11% are saying borrow. Uh, the general public in the UK, 40% of people would use their savings. 14% would make extra money and a whopping 46% would borrow or go into debt over an unexpected emergency spending. I think that's key here to say that borrowing means debt because often we use these words that make it sound not as painful as it actually is. So 46% are actually going into debt to cope with these unexpected spending and emergencies. Yes. Isabel in the chat says, because uh, I've listened to your podcast, etc. I have an emergency fund. Nice work, Isabel. 46% um, go into debt over unexpected spending. That's everyone. Do you think it's higher for single parents? Do you think it goes up? Yeah, there's a nod from Anne. Single parents, 61% go into debt over emergency spending. So it is a lot higher. Then what about our good friends, the higher rate tax payers? So the people who earn more. Are people who earn more more likely to go into debt over emergency funding uh, spending? What do you think? Amber says yes, mm. which is interesting. Anne's nodding. Yeah, and higher rate tax payers, you'd think if they earned more, they wouldn't need it. Um, but 64% of them go into debt over an emergency, which like, that baked my noodle and it yeah. took me a long time to work out why. Surely they're earning more, the emergencies are less, less because they have more money to deal with it. We'll come on to why. We'll come on to why. We're going to tell you why. And then finally, the last group, uh, what about 18 to 34 year olds? Oh, those youngsters. Those youngsters, uh, which I'm more sure there's a few of them on the call. More likely than um, the general public or, or less, less likely. likely. It's actually quite interesting. 69% of 18 to 34 year olds will go out into debt over the emergency fund. So, uh, Alan, uh, is what you're saying is if I'm a parent, I'm in the higher tax rate, so I earn more money and I'm under 35, I'm screwed. Uh, you have a high percentage <laughs> chances of your finances are not in a great state. And actually, that's one of the things we need to look at, because going into debt for any reason isn't an ideal thing. But it's fascinating. 53% of British people treat themselves to unnecessary things, despite knowing that they can't afford it which I find that fascinating. And then you compound on that. Millions of us are facing poverty in retirement because we aren't saving enough. And I always find this interesting. 75% of adults in the UK believe they're good at saving, but only 50% of adults have less than 10 grand in savings. 
You know, like how does that add up? Most of us think we're good at savings, but we don't have enough saved up for emergencies, for retirement. Is £11,500 going to give you a good retirement? No. Probably not. So, so we're in a pickle, aren't we? So we don't have enough, like we're in debt in general. Households have credit card debt and all sorts of things on taking on store credit and other things that 0% debt is still debt. They can't cover these emergencies, the 46%. Nearly half of people need to go into debt to deal with that. We're not saving enough for retirement. And poverty in retirement is increasing, which I find crazy. No, and this is very cheery, isn't it? <laughs> like, this is a bit doom and gloom. I thought people came and joined us because they thought we were uplifting and like spending time with us in positivity. Most of the time we are, but if we don't look at the problem, we can't fix it. But no matter how bad it seems to get and how hard it seems to be, there is always a bright future that we can move towards. And if we take our action today, we will change our financial destiny and where we're going. The key is to take action. Because money is the only game that we all have to play. It's not like it's optional. It's not like it's like tennis or chess or Monopoly where you think, I don't know, maybe I will, maybe I won't. This is not optional. This is something that we all have to do. You can't opt out. And yet, who taught who taught you the rules? Who taught you how to play this game that is absolutely mandatory? Did anyone teach you the rules? Did anyone explain to you how to do this? My mum taught me uh, to pay off my credit card each month, which I'm very grateful for. But lots of people don't even know you can set up a credit uh, direct debit to pay your credit card off each month. We just don't get taught this stuff. And it's a bit like going to play Monopoly. Uh, this is for Anne, the Sheffield edition. Uh, <laughs> it's like going to play Monopoly, but without knowing the rules. Imagine if we sat you down and went, you had to play this game. We're not going to teach you the rules. And opposite you, we're going to put the best people in the world at finances. You're going to play Monopoly against these people. Do you know who this is? Uh, it's Warren Buffett, one of the best investors ever. Uh, how about this one? You should recognise this person. Oprah Winfrey. Uh, she's a female billionaire. She's built incredible businesses. And then you've got Bill Gates in the other corner. Imagine if you played Monopoly against these three without knowing the rules. Would you stand a chance? I don't think I'd stand a chance. I would no. not fancy my... You, you're a very good Monopoly player I'm as well. I'm not bad at Monopoly. I still didn't win the World Championship. And imagine as well, it's as if you're being sent out to play this really tough physical game with no training, no understanding of the rules, and you're being sent out onto the playing field with these large, hulky men. You're just <laughs> going to get... Well, it might be enjoyable, but you're basically going to get slaughtered because you don't know what you're doing. You haven't been prepared. You haven't been trained for this. And that is not your fault. That's the way it is that none of us are really taught how to look after our finances. But now it is your responsibility to start to learn. So today is all about teaching you the rules of the money game and understanding those rules and starting to implement them in your life. Enough. We get it. Tell us the rules. Let's get going. Uh, but before we do that, we have a quick message from our lawyers. This is our disclaimer. This is not financial advice. We are not regulated. We are not financial advisors. We're not going to try and sell you anything to make your own decision to share your opinions and ideas. These ideas may not continue to work for us or for you. You're 100% responsible for your financial future which is actually quite exciting. And there are no guarantees here. Oh, that's not true. We do have a 100% money back guarantee for anyone that does not enjoy this workshop. <laughs> so let's get straight into this. The rules of the money game. Uh, none of this is rocket science. None of it at all. But the most dangerous words in running training sessions are, I know that. So what I want you to do is if you catch yourself, like we say, the first rule of this finances is, is this. If you catch yourself saying, I know that, the question is not whether you know it. The question is, are you doing it? And what Katie and I have come to understand is if you're not doing it, then you don't know it. Because lots of people say, yeah, 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 I know that but they never do it. So if you catch yourself with that sentence, what I want you to do is explore beyond it and go, am I actually implementing this in my life? Am I doing it? 
am I living it? I think that's particularly true of if you've already been on rebel finance school, these ideas are probably not going to be new to you, but take it as a refresher and check how many of the rules are you following? And as Ellen said, are you actually doing it? And we're going to give you concrete ways to implement these rules. Are you doing this? So this course has been put on by us and the Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead. But do these money rules apply all over the world in Windsor, Maidenhead, Bangladesh, Basingstoke? Do they apply all over the world? Yes, they do. Yes. The specifics might be different in different places. You might have different ways of applying tax and different account types and all that fun stuff. But the principles are universal. So if you're joining us on YouTube from other parts of the world, be assured that despite our funny accents, this applies wherever you are. The principles are the same the world over. And it tickled me slightly that when I was looking at where you're joining in from, uh, we had asked you what country uh, are you joining in from? And someone replied, with this place. Does anyone know where this is? Do you know which country this is? I don't think it's actually it's a country. It's, is not, it? it's not a country. <laughs> it is the Isle of Wight. So even on the Isle of Wight, these rules still apply. Exactly. Now, we can't cover everything in two hours, but we can give it our best shot. And that's what we're going to do. So make notes. And we're going to come back to this right at the end. But we want you to work out what you're going to do about all of this because a workshop without action is pointless we need to actually do something that's how we improve our finances so as we're going and things occur to you or ideas hit you please jot them down because at the end we're going to come back and say which of these things are you actually going to commit to doing in the next week Exactly. 10 points for Kay, who guessed that was yes, the Isle of Kay. Wight. I love it. Eddie, it wasn't Germany, I'm afraid, but 10 points for Kay for guessing it. So rule number one, the foundation of all good finances, whether you're running a business or your personal life, is to create a gap. Bigger the gap, the better. And what is a gap? A gap is the difference between the money you've got coming in and the money you've got going out. So if you work for someone, you've got your salary coming in and you've got the money you spend each week. If you work for yourself, you're self-employed, how much do you earn? How much do you spend? And the difference is the gap. The gap is the most critical piece. Uh, what do most people do when they see that there's a gap and they, oh, yeah, there's money left at the end of the month? What do most people do? They go, yeah. What should we spend it on? <laughs> Thereby meaning that there is no gap whatsoever. And this is all about keeping some of the money that you're earning and not spending it all. That is the only way to get ahead with your finances. Exactly. Sophia said, waste it. Ha -ha. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what everyone does. They're like, I've got money left. What can I spend it on? The key is to create a gap between what you're spending and what you're not. So I did have a funky chart, so let's annotate this. Imagine you've got your spending and the spending, is, sorry, you've got your income. So this is your salary. It's roughly the same every month. Now, most people's spending kind of goes up and down around it. So some months they spend less than they earn, some months they spend more than they earn, and it kind of goes up and down each month. And then they spend a bit too much, so they rein it in, and then they come back the other side. So some months they have a positive gap, i.e. they've got money to save, and some months they have a negative gap, i.e. they spent more than they've earned. But your job, and what we want to do, is to increase our earnings and to reduce our expenditure so that we create a huge gap between the two. Because this gap, this gap between the two is the key bit that we need to actually focus on having. Because if we don't have a gap, then we can't build up an emergency fund, we can't save, invest, we can't do any of that stuff. So this is what we actually need to do, is to build a gap between the two. Because what most people do when they earn that extra money is that their expenses come up to join it as well. So we just want to keep that gap 
as big as possible and to be focused on that. That is the thing that you need to be focusing on every day, week, month, when you're thinking about finances. How can I increase that gap? If you've got a negative gap, i.e. you're spending more than you earn, you're slowly going into debt, you've got trouble. And this can happen to anyone for any reason. Uh, my parents did this in their own business for several years and it does not end up well. Or maybe there's zero gap, meaning that you spend absolutely everything that you have coming in. Or the best option, positively, you've got a positive gap, i.e. you collect more than you spend and you actually keep some of it to do something with. So how do you get a bigger gap? Well, increase your income and reduce your spending. So firstly, increase income. You might be thinking, well, that's not possible. That's not possible for me. Well, we've got some in-depth workshops coming up for you to help you think about how you might increase your income. So next Thursday, we've got the salary trap how to boost your income, how to break free of the salary you're at and work to increase it. And then we've got uh, on the fourth, we've got how to build a side hustle to make extra money. And then reduce your spending. You might think, well, I don't really want to do that. I want to live a cool life and it costs money and I don't want to like deprive myself. Uh, so we have the lovely Laura joining us on Monday. We're going to be talking about living large on a small budget, how to get the most from your money and to enjoy your life whilst getting ahead with your finances. I've always been incredibly impressed with Laura. She goes to some amazing places and does it for so little. It's incredible. Uh, we have a little sign up form for updates. If you live in the Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead, please use this link and sign up to the courses. Please do it for us. It is very important because the wonderful Saloni who's on the call has funded this workshops by the council and they need to know it's actually helping residents. So if you live in the area, please fill this out. If you're in the rest of the world, please use this link and give us your name and email address and we will send you uh, all of the course resources and all of the details. So it is increase income, reduce spending to create a gap. Then the question becomes... What do you do with the gap, What Katie? do you do with what this do money do? that's accumulating? And I think this is why a lot of people just spend the gap, because they think, well, I don't know what to do with it. So or they pay off their mortgage, oh, which is not true. such a bad thing. So we'll come on to that in later sessions. So what to do with the gap? Well, firstly, build an emergency fund. And we're going to come on to what that means. Secondly, pay off expensive debt. By that, we mean credit card debt, store card debt, personal loans, car payments, anything that's above around 5% interest rate. Then you move on to increasing your emergency fund to three to six months living expenses because things go wrong and we need a decent emergency fund if things go wrong. And the final step is to buy assets. And you might think, what on earth is an asset? How do I know where to do that? Where is the asset shop? We will come on to that as well. So before we do that, we'd love to know which step you are on right now. So we have a poll. Uh, please vote on that. Or if you're watching on YouTube, please use the QR code. Even if you're watching on YouTube catch up many weeks from now, please use the QR code and actually tell us where you are, because this helps us to understand where our audience is and where to target our content and how best to help you to make progress. It is so critical for us to do that. The link is also in the description of the YouTube video as well. If yeah. the QR code's a bit fiddly to scan, you can find it there. Exactly. And the wonderful Derek has also put it in the chat. We love you, Derek. Thank you Thank for helping. Thank you, Derek. Uh, so we've got about 20% who are paying off the high interest rate debt. Uh, we've got 15% building the emergency fund. And then the rest of people are already on the asset step, which is fascinating. Uh, which we'll come on to why that's fascinating in a bit. Perfect. So I'm going to end the poll and we're going to move on to the next bit, which no gap, big trouble. Uh, you might be thinking, why is there a picture of a random shack? The reason is if you build your house on a swamp, you're in trouble. If you build your finances on a rocky base, on a like unlevel base on a swamp, you are in trouble. If you don't have a gap between your income and your spending every month, it's going to be an up and down ride with some problems coming up. So this might sound like it's a basic thing, but is the absolute critical base 
of everything we do. If you ever catch yourself going, I don't know why this isn't working for me, go back to, do I have a gap between my income and my spending? So this first rule has been to create a gap. And for each of the rules, we have some tips of how to play this game and at different levels, depending where you're starting from. So this is the time for you to be jotting down in your notebook which one of these you're going to be doing. So the first level is just to know if you have a gap. What is your gap? What did you spend last month? What did you earn? What's the difference between the two? That is your gap. If you could tell us what your gap is now without checking, uh, put some kind of symbol in the chat, maybe a pineapple or an X or something <laughs> like that, because uh, we'd love to know. If you can't, that's OK. That's the first step. Level two is come on the two gap widening workshops. So we've got the increase your income and reduce your spending workshops. And the side hustle one. And well. the side hustle oh, one. Quite a few and tips then, for widening the gap. Yes, we have. Level three? Level three is to be tracking that gap every single month. And what we say a lot here at Rebel Finance School is that what gets measured gets improved. We're going to come onto that in a later rule. But just to be knowing what you have every month and seeing the trend. Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it going sideways? And if you don't even know what your gap is or if you have one, as Alan said, you're building on a swampy bed rather than a solid concrete base. Uh, Isabel Jackson says, I have a gap which I'm using to pay off debt. Nice work. But I'm also working on a side hustle, which is using some of the gap, trying very hard not to get into more debt in the process. Mm -hmm. Feels a bit chicken and egg. Isabel, there is a way to build your side hustle without that debt. Come on the side hustle workshop that we're doing and we'll show you how to do that. Uh, Jeff says, my wife keeps spending my gap. <laughs> Rachel says unicorn. Carol says pineapple. I love that. Uh, and my flower patch says I'm now on level three, thanks to mm. Rebels, which is incredible. Right. Let's get on to rule number two, which is have an emergency fund. Emergency funds are critical to your progress in finance. One of the examples is this is the tower block we used to live in in Basingstoke or Amazing Stoke, as I like to call it. And whilst in the pandemic, we had some rental properties. And the tenants of one rental property just decided not to pay rent. I don't know if that ever happens to any of you, but they just decided they weren't going to pay rent. And they basically sent us a message and say, we're not paying rent for three months. Now, the bank would give us a holiday on our mortgage, but they won't let us off our mortgage. We still had to pay that. And you can be left in an absolute pickle when these things go wrong. And it doesn't just have to be when a pandemic happens, the car crashes, um, something else happens, the washing machine breaks. Like an emergency is critical to have that emergency fund to survive those things. Your other example was Rebel Business School during the pandemic as well. Yeah, Rebel Business School, which was the, the business that we ran, uh, Oh, we ran live workshops. So we didn't used to do them like this on Zoom and YouTube. We ran live workshops with people sitting in front of us. And overnight, every single person, starting with the event I most wanted to do, which was going to be in New York with Google, every single one cancelled. And we lost quarter of a million pounds worth of businesses in about three days uh, and had no income. If you don't have an emergency fund, you go out of business quick so quick. So this is critical. And we said earlier, the percentage of Brits that go into debt to cope with an emergency, it's like half of us. What is an emergency? The car blows up, you lose your job. Your tax bill is not an emergency. So if you've ever caught yourself going, I don't have enough money for my tax bill, you need to have saved for that. That is definitely not an emergency. If you want some extra help on that, we wrote an article about this, or we did a video on the emergency fund as well. People often ask us, well, what do I, where do I put this money? Uh, the ideal thing is that it be in an easy access savings account as high interest as you can find or premium bonds in the UK are a great thing because you can put your money in and get back that same amount. And there's a chance of winning a, a prize because they pull the money and pay the interest out in prizes, which is very cool. But the key 
is that you do not invest this money. This money needs to be outside in cash, easily accessible within a couple of days to be able to pay for these things that inevitably happen in life. There will always be things like this happening. And Stephen Murray in the chat says a healthy emergency fund somehow prevents emergencies. I agree, Stephen. It's like if you live in the UK, as most of us do, then it's I think of it like having an umbrella when you go out. If you take your umbrella with you, will it rain? Not normally. No, and if it does, you don't care. Does it? It's like you are prepared for these things and somehow you don't seem to have, it doesn't feel like an emergency when these things happen because you're like, oh, emergency fund, that will cope with that. So it doesn't feel like an emergency. It's amazing how it happens. And it's like the world knows that you're ready for it. So it it knows it doesn't have to test you. Exactly. Sarah says it's FU money and it definitely is. So here's the cheat sheet on this. Level one, start your emergency fund. Open an account, a savings jar, premium bond account, doesn't matter, and put one pound in. Start your emergency fund is level one. Level two is working towards having a thousand pounds or whatever the equivalent is in your currency in a high interest saving account or premium bonds or wherever you're going to put it. And level three is working towards having that full emergency fund of three to six months. Those are the three levels. I uh, remember the first time we ran this course, someone said to us, what do you expect us to do? Find a thousand pounds down the back of the sofa? Maybe you can find a pound down the back of the sofa and start with that. But we're not expecting you just to magic it up. Yeah, because she said, oh, this isn't for me then, is it? I can't get ahead because I don't have the first step. I can't put my thousand pounds straight away into the emergency fund. Exactly. Uh, so rule three is start small, start where you are and have fun along the way. I don't care whether you're heavily in debt, not got anything, you think you're past it. I don't care. If you are breathing, you can make things better and we can improve from where we are. That's the key, key piece with rule number three is just start where you are. That's all we want you to do. You can always make things better. And Joanne in the chat says, had a 600 uh, emergency at the vet last night. Glad to have an emergency fund. Yes, makes such a difference to have an emergency fund. So that's rule three. Uh, let's get on to the next piece. Oh, the levels of things to do for this next rule. So the first one would be do something tonight right now after the workshop ends to improve your finances. And we're going to give you plenty of ideas over the next few rules. And that's why you want to be jotting down the notes of what you can do to improve your situation, however small it might feel. Taking those few actions day after day is how it will compound over time. And that's what level that's two level is. two is do something every day to improve your finances. We used to do this every single day. We go for a walk and work out how we could make things better. And then the final level, level three, is to do do that with the people around you. So maybe it's with your kids, maybe it's with your partner. If you don't have a partner, it's a, with someone from the Rebel Finance School group. Doesn't matter who it's with, start working and improving on this together because together we can make so much more progress. So that's rule three. We're going to move on to the next little bit, which we have another poll for you. Uh, do you know where all your money goes? Have you ever had this where at the end of the month you go, Where's all the money gone? Where has it gone? Uh, so vote now, use the poll, or if you're on YouTube or catch up, please scan the QR code or it's in the chat. Uh, we want to know, do you know exactly where the money goes? Do you know exactly what you spent last month? And do you know how much you spend on average each month? And if the QR code's a bit fiddly, if you're on YouTube, all the links are in the description of the video. And the reason for asking this, quite often people come to us and say, yeah, I know exactly what I spend. I know what my mortgage is. I know what my utilities are. And they tell us they spend that figure, but that's not what they really spend because there is always more spending each month. And it is fascinating. So if you said yes, roughly, we would take that as probably, no, you don't know what you're spending. Under cross-examination, people usually crumble at that <laughs> And we don't mean to do that. It's no, just we're not being mean. <laughs> fascinating, because like if you don't really know what you're spending, it's really tough to do this stuff. Uh, so it's about 60% say yes, 40% say no for last month, 
uh, 40% saying yes, they track it exactly every month, which is incredible. We've got about 30% yes, roughly, uh, 15% saying no, and 5%, I have no clue where the money goes and the spending. So why are we saying this? That is because what gets measured gets improved. So rule four, track your money. And most people in the general population follow the head in the sand approach to their finances. Who's that? That is actually me with my head in the sand. <laughs> I'm very committed to the photographs in our PowerPoint. Uh, we went out to the beach and I put my head down there. Um, the head in the sand I don't know, strategy does not work because people are like, well, I don't really know. I'm just going to do what I do and I'll deal with it later. Yeah, that's tomorrow me's problem. I'll deal with it at some point. And then you'd suddenly find years down the line, having followed that strategy for so long, is then you go, oh, whoops, I need to do something about it now. And this is all about knowing your situation and it might feel uncomfortable to start with you might think oh I don't really want to look because it's painful or it's going to be painful to sort things out but that knowledge is key to then being able to change things and actually if you're in a not so great situation but working to improve it you're in a much better situation than someone that's doing sort of okay but gradually deteriorating you want to be on that upward trajectory and the only way to know that is to look and to track what's happening. If you are sat next to someone right now, please look at them and say, I want to know where the money goes. If you're I want not- to know where the money goes. Thank you, Katie. If you're not sat next to anyone, point at yourself and go, I need to know where the money goes. I need to know where the money goes. We need to know where this stuff goes. What gets measured gets improved. If we know where it goes and we know how much it's going, we can work to improve it and get more value from our money. I want to go a little bit more into what gets measured gets improved. What does that even mean? What that means is if you don't track, you don't even know you're going in the right direction. You don't know if you're getting better or not. Whereas if you're tracking it, like you measure your spending and your income each month, you can then go, have I improved it this month? Am I heading in the right direction? And if I keep going like this, where will I end up? Mm. And actually the very act of looking, make, you like you can't help but change it. You start to look at where your money's going. You're thinking, I'm spending how much on this subscription that I never use? You can't help but change it and cancel that and do something about it in the moment with that real-time knowledge rather than waiting months down the line and going, oh, whoops, I've been paying for this for months. Just looking at it, you can't help but make those changes. Alexandra says, do you have any templates for tracking your expenses? Actually, we use an app on our phone to do it. The one we use is called Emma. There's also one called Snoop. There's quite a few of them out there. And then the other templates, we actually have templates for tracking these things on our website. And we do this monthly finance meeting. Just word of warning on the Emma app. I'm not that big a fan of it. It tries to sell you all sorts of things. It's going to try and tell you to consolidate your pensions with someone that charges really high fees. Who is it's that? Gonna, pension B. Avoid pension B. It's going to tell you, oh, do you, have you thought about taking out a loan? You don't need to do that. It's, it tries to push you all these products, which is how it makes its money. It will encourage you to buy into different stocks, which you just want to avoid any of that. If you can just trust yourself to use the functionality, which is to just track your expenses, then great. If you think you're going to get sucked in by bright colored things that are trying to sell you stuff, then I would avoid Emma. I think it's, it's sending you down the wrong track and it would not be following a lot of these money rules that we're going to talk about today. Exactly. Now, how do we actually look at this? We have a monthly finance meeting where we go out for a nice breakfast and we sit down and chat about our finances. We do it together. Uh, over the years of having run Rebel Finance School, people in the group have started to do their finance meetings together. So I wonder, is there someone you can do your monthly finance meeting with? A friend, a partner, um, 
maybe Daniel, you do it with the person next to you on the couch. Unless you don't like her, then that's fine. Choose someone else. <laughs> if you have um, kids that are old enough to sort of understand these concepts and get them involved as well. And even if you think they're not able to understand, this is the way to get them and get them talking about money. Because it's such a taboo subject, isn't it, in most cultures, that this is a chance to say, this is something we talk about. Mm-hmm. We're open about it. We look at it. And this is how we can all improve together. Then make it a recurring thing that happens once a month. Update your numbers. So we just sit down, we update our spending. How big is our gap and our net worth? And then we look at those things. And that's what we do once a month, just to make sure we're on the right track, because what gets measured gets improved. We've got a resource to share with you exactly how we do that in one moment. Yes, Derek's put it in the chat as well, which is awesome. He is amazing. Uh, Some months you won't feel like you've made any progress that is okay. It happens. Just go back to focusing on what you can control, which was the key from the very first workshop is focus on what you can control. Isabel says, does the dog count for the meeting? Yes, you can do a finance meeting with the dog. Definitely. Yes, and perhaps look at the dog spending as well. <laughs> yes, it should have its own separate category. So we've got this resource, scan the QR code, find the link in the chat. That is for how to run a monthly finance meeting. And there's probably words and terms that we've used in this little bit, like maybe net worth. You're not sure what that means. It'll go into it a bit more on the monthly finance meeting. And this is one of those areas where we can't really give you everything that we want to in just this short two hour workshop. So what we're going to do is invite you to Rebel Finance School where we go into this in a lot more detail. And that will be coming up in May. Eddie says, can I see the links in chat after the live session is over? Eddie, yes, you can see them in the chat. We will send an email out afterwards with all of those links as well. And in the YouTube description, they have those as well. So there are three places to find that uh, that you can do. And then my flower patch has said, I've now set up a net worth tracker for my 12 year old son as well as myself and booked a finance meeting with my husband for next week. Uh, I only discovered you in December. Nice work. That is incredible. Welcome, Sarah. We love having you here. Uh, So the levels for this particular one are level one. And this is the simplest possible version. Just sit down and once a month say, how can we improve things? How can we improve our finances? If you just did that once a month, how can we improve our finances? You'll make so much progress. Number two, track your numbers each month. So this is doing the monthly finance meeting. How much did you spend? What is your gap? And how is your net worth doing? Your net worth means how much money you have. And level three is do it with other people. It's always better when you do it with other people. Uh, Friends, lover, someone from the Facebook group, someone you roughly like the look of, doesn't really matter. Find someone off the street, doesn't really matter. Um, So there you go. Those are the rules for that bit. Uh, We've now got on to level five, rule five, which we're going to do. And then we're going to ask you what you think so far. So rule five is avoid debt like the plague. And this is the weirdest picture of Laura, who's running next week's workshop I have ever seen. Um, 53% of Brits treat themselves to unnecessary things despite knowing they can't afford it, which I think is crazy. And it's because of this current movement of... I deserve this, Alan. No, you don't. (laughs) Which actually we'll come on to in a later rule. But that's the thing. It's like, well, I'll go into debt because I deserve it. You only live once, right? Let's do it. I was sat in Mexico this week at the first ever Rebel Business School in Mexico, which was incredible seeing it in Spanish. And I was sat opposite a Santander bank and I saw this advert. For those of you who speak Spanish, you probably know what it means. Uh, I will translate it for you. The difference between an escape And an unforgettable experience is your credit. Like, can you believe that? How big your credit limit is decides how unforgettable your life is. I'm just kind of shocked by that, Santander. Uh, There are ways to have a good time without a good credit limit. (laughs) But look at these young, attractive couple, how happy they are. They're surely living their best life going into debt. Yeah, I think they're in debt, definitely. The number of happy people that they show when they're trying to push debt onto people is is shocking. I feel like it should be like smoking where <laughs> they show the real impact of it. People 
you know, being in a right pickle rather than being happy and looking at maps and spending all their money. And what I really want you to get is there are teams of marketing professionals at all of these companies. They are some of the most highly paid people in the world and their entire job is to take money out of your pocket and get you to spend it with them. There are people that are paid to part you with your cash. Your job is to know they're doing it and to avoid it and to get the training to be able to do it. And debt that is 0% is still debt. You're still borrowing money. And in a way, you're kind of betting on future you being able to make those monthly payments. And the minute you start to miss the monthly payments on a lot of these deals, then the interest kicks in. And that's when you can be in a bit of trouble. So remember, just because they're not expecting any interest from you, it's still debt. And the average credit card debt per household, do you know how much the average household has on a credit card? Do you have anything on a credit card? Do you know how much it is? And how much have you got on your credit cards? Do you know? She's rocking slightly. Uh, hopefully she knows. Um, do you know how much it is? I'm going to tell you, it is £2,600 on average per household. The average interest rate is 20%, and I think it's going up at the moment. Uh, do you know what the time is to pay that off at minimum payments? If you had £2,600 on a credit card at minimum payments, how many weeks, months, years would it take you to pay it off? Eddie says he's got no credit card debt, which is fantastic. Um, yeah. Like, how long does it take you to pay it off? Because this one shocked me. It takes 26 years, 27 years to pay it off minimum payments. You end up in financial slavery to these credit cards, paying monthly on these things. It is shocking. That's why we say you have to avoid this at all costs. Because basically it's built on compounding. And compounding is a concept. It's like a maths concept that's sometimes difficult to get, but we're going to try and make it clear. And we're going to do that through an analogy. A game of golf. Anyone fancy a game of golf? Who'd like to play a game of golf? Saloni, are you there? I've Would you like to up. play golf? Would you like to bet with us? And <laughs> let's make this a little bit feisty, a little bit spicy. And we are going to bet on each hole. And the first bet will bet 20 pence. And then each next hole will double the bet. So it'll be 40 pence. So it's not too bad, is it? The next hole will be 40 pence. The hole after that will be 80 pence and so on. After 18 holes, or on the 18th hole, what will the bet be? What do you think the bet would be? We're just doubling the bet each time. So, you know, just going from 20 pence, 40 pence, and so on. But what do you think? How big is the bet by the end of it? How much would you be wagering against us? And would you take that bet? Anne is doing the maths in her head, I can see, because her <laughs> eyes have gone upwards and probably directing, distracting her. Daniel's working out if he's going to take that bet or not. Yeah, One it's interesting. One says Lanu on the YouTube chat. Uh, MC is like, there's no way I'm playing that game against you. Uh, <laughs> it's quite interesting. It goes from 20 pence to 40 pence to 80 pence. £1.60, £3.20. By hole nine we are gambling on £819, which is kind of crazy. That's gone around the wrong way, Katie, that eight ninety. Never mind. Oh, that is completely incorrect. I do apologise. By hold nine, we should be on £5120. Yeah. Uh, then it goes to £102, £200, £168, and it just keeps going up. And by the end hole, we're actually gambling for £26,000 per hole, which is just crazy when you start on a 20 pence bet. And that's the power of compounding is it all happens at the very end. So if we did it on a chart, you're basically not even gambling anything on the first eight or nine holes. And then the increase towards the end is insane. And that's exactly what happens with compounding for you on your investments and against you when you're in debt. And it all comes back to the gap, Katie. So if you have a positive gap and you're investing this money and using it for you and for your future, then compounding 
works for you. So it's going up, just like that graph that we saw with the golf. But if it's if you have a negative gap and you're having to borrow money to fund your lifestyle, then it works against you in exactly the same way, but opposite. So instead of going like whoosh and up, it looks like nothing's happening to start with. It looks level, level, level. And then eventually it will start working incredibly against you and start doing the same in the opposite direction and going really against you. And compounding works against you when you have a negative gap and for you when you have a positive gap. So again, this is the power of the gap. It all comes back to that gap. The very first rule of the rules of the money game, create a positive gap so that the graph on the left-hand side happens and not the one on the right. Because we've met people that we've done the debt case study on for the course that had interest rates of 50% on their overdrafts and their debt was compounding against them quicker than they could have paid it off, which is insane. Uh, truly spotted a couple of our numbers were wrong on that slide. She's right. Uh, <laughs> we spotted it as well we as we did it. Numbers. We'll correct that, we'll for, correct next that for next time. Um, so here's how to start playing this level. Level one is just to understand where you are. If you have debt, create a table mm. of the amounts the interest rates, the details, and know your starting position because clarity is power. The clearer we can see the situation you are, the clearer we can deal with it. And just putting it in a table really helps because it will force you to say, okay, what's the amount? What's the interest rate, which you probably wouldn't know without looking it up. And just being extremely clear helps because often you'll have all these ideas in your head. Oh, I've got that one over there and that one over there and holding it in your head just confuses you put it out on paper level two is watch our video about the debt attack strategy coming up next on the slide is the link and we'll put it in the chat too and level three is come to the full rebel finance school and we've got an entire workshop on how people get into debt and how to get out of debt and we'll help you with that so here's the link to the video we will put it in the chat as well so that you'll be able to watch that later so if you are struggling you know someone who is share this video with them it is the quickest way to get out of debt so that is that level what we're going to do now is take a short comfort break of five minutes we will answer some of your questions you are allowed to jump around the room and find your energy or go to the bathroom or eat a banana or whatever <laughs> it is that you want to do in this break. And we will answer a few questions and we will start the workshop again in five minutes. I'll set a timer. Set a timer, Katie. Uh, so please tell us right now, what have you learned? What are your questions? What are your thinking around the first five rules that we have here? So I would love to know, what are your thinking so far about this? Hopefully someone's writing something in the chat right now, because we'd love to know what you think. Yeah, well, which of the tips are you going to commit to implementing after the workshop or maybe during the workshop? Maybe you're so inspired that you're going off doing things. What have you learned? What have you thought? What hasn't made sense? Or did you catch yourself when you heard one of those saying, I know that? And then going, I might know that, but do I actually do it? Marie Delcy says, widen the gap. Yes, it's all about the gap. It is all about the gap. The gap is critical. Sophia says, the monthly meeting with my partner, I've been emailing him bits and bobs during the Zoom. I yes, love that. Get him in. Yeah, write an agenda. Get him tied down. Marie Delcy also says about the monthly finance meeting. That's we actually great. love the monthly finance meeting. We look meeting. forward to it for so basically the whole month, we do it on the last day of the month and we look forward to it and we make it fun and go out for breakfast and look at our numbers and think about how we can improve our lives. Isabel says, going to make a spreadsheet to map my spending and book in the monthly finance meeting with the doggo. Yes, invite whoever you want. If it's the dog, the guinea pig, the cat. Uh, Daniel says we have some 0% interest debt, which has effectively enabled us to fix out our kitchen now rather than save for five years. Cash flow wise, it seems the same. We actually used some 0% interest debt to buy our furniture for our first property because uh, we needed somewhere to sit. Sometimes like it is the best form of debt, but it is still debt. Uh, and we've got to try and avoid it if we can. 
but we understand it. Like if you're going to have any, that is the type to have. Um, so yeah, I don't have too much of a problem with it, Daniel. Just enjoy the kitchen. Uh, and it's always the thing, like how much of making the kitchen can you do yourself rather than paying someone else to do it? There's always different bits. <laughs> like pointing to part guy i did it uh nice work um Anne says uh overpay my loan even if it's pennies yes it you'll be surprised how much of a difference it makes when you start paying extra payments off and the impact it has on the overall interest that you pay as long as the time as well as the time to pay it off it makes a huge difference huge um, difference Gail says, watched the debt attack strategy and redid it, realised what had been 0% is now 23%. That's the thing. These deals end, don't they? They get you in on the 0% transfer deal. Maybe it lasts a year, 18 months or whatever. And then people don't put it in the calendar. And then suddenly, oh, I'm being charged 23% now. That is the key. That is why you need to be on top of this. And something that you can also do in your monthly finance meeting as well is just to monitor what's happening with those things. It's the same. That's what they all do. They get you in with a month of this or the free this, and then it bumps up to paying. Just like Amazon Prime, you get a month free, and then they rely on the fact that most people forget to ca cancel it, and they keep paying for years later. Uh, there's a top tip for you. Check now if you've got Amazon Prime without really realizing it and cancel it. Most people don't need it. Um, perfect. How are we doing on time, Katie? We still have a minute and a half. Awesome. Uh, Sarah says need to get back to the monthly finance meetings and sort a side hustle or two. Ooh, we've got something coming up. We've on got that. a workshop coming up on side hustles. Come along to that one. I'm pretty sure it will help. Uh, Rachel says she's changing to a SIM only mobile provider and some frugal food spending. Love that. That's fantastic. Mary says I'm a bit addicted to checking my gap at least every day. It's good to check. Yes. And the flips say, does it make sense to think uh, you shouldn't be putting it on credit if you don't have the cash to pay it off? Like that's the ideal way to look at it is never put something on credit that you can't afford. That is the ideal way to look at it. There's no, like, I was going to caveat it, but that is definitely the ideal way to look at it. Uh, Julie Park says, I'm overpaying my next account. It's £400 and the interest is ridiculous. Yes, store cards are killer. Absolutely killer. Um, and then you've got uh, Bussisot. Can you, I've butchered your name, I apologise. Can you explain the negative compounding effect to your investments in long period market downturns? Um, so the answer is not quickly in the next 30 seconds. No, uh, the key to investing is you invest over decades and it won't affect you over the long term. The stock market goes up on average 10 to 12% over each year over the long run. So those market downturns will affect you short term, but not long term. Then final comment, Amber, Netflix is killing me. Yes, Amber, get rid of it, get your life back and uh, just watch us on Monday and Thursday nights. Far better. <laughs> Amber actually said Netflix is killing me. I think that's something else. Maybe <laughs> who knows? Sounds I thought it was a spelling error. So I said Netflix, but you never know. I just uh, get amused by things like that. Uh, so welcome back. Let's get to the part two. So we are going to move straight on to rule number six. I want it. I want it. I want it. But you do not deserve it. You do not deserve it. Sounds quite harsh. It does. Mm -hmm. But do you deserve to be in financial slavery? Like turn to the person next to you and say, do you deserve to be in financial slavery? If there's no one next to you, say it to yourself. Because um, the average credit card takes 26 years, seven months to pay off at minimum payments. You are in financial slavery if you do that. And Katie and I have this expression of buy your freedom first. Buy your freedom first. Don't buy stuff. Buy your freedom. That's the critical bit for us. It makes such a difference. And what does that even mean? Well, buying your freedom means creating the gap and using the gap to put towards your emergency fund, to paying off your high interest rate debt, and then eventually 
to get on to buying assets, which we'll explain a bit more shortly what that means. But that's what it means, because like buying a freedom, it sounds really like exciting, but what does that mean? It means using the gap in those ways. So let me give you the most extreme example. Would you prefer a BMW or five years off your retirement date? Which would you prefer? Because if you took the money you would spend on a new BMW and invested it instead, you could retire five years earlier. Uh, and it depends. Some of you will go, I really want a BMW. And I honour you for that choice. Please go to a garage, start buying one. You will be in debt forever. Uh, I would take the five years. Andy says five years. Alexandra says five years. McFlip say any day of the week and twice on Sundays, they would take five years. Uh, Isabel says five years, please. Never like BMWs anyway. Isabel, maybe insert Audi then if you don't like BMWs or any other fancy car. We personally went with the small car. We bought the Skoda Citigo. It was tiny. Uh, we barely fitted in it, but I loved it. It's like a go-kart. So um, yeah, it was £20 road tax a year. It was so cheap. I loved it. And we got five years off our retirement date from compared to a fancy car. Like that's the question. Do you want freedom or do you want stuff? Uh, Carol says cute car. Thank that's because we washed it to sell it. <laughs> it didn't normally <laughs> look like that. <laughs> it was battered. Um, and we always have this thing of how many hours do I have to work to get this thing? Like for a BMW, it's five years. But whatever it is, you can work out. How many hours do you have to work to get that thing? Davinda noticed I had a private Ooh. registration plate on the car. Yes, I did. I bought it before I knew it. It was 800 and something pounds and I regret it. And I apologize for my sins. <laughs> okay. You don't have to go into I'm a shame spiral. I genuinely feel bad <laughs> about it. It's like, uh, if I'd have known better, I would have not done it. But we all make mistakes in the past. I did not know about this stuff then. No one had taught me, buy freedom, don't buy a personalised number plate. Anyway, moving on quickly. How many hours did I have to work for my personalised number plate? Ooh, we can many. That out, Let's we? not punish me for past but, but mistakes. Let's give you a... No, that's a really good point, actually. This When it comes to sorting out your finances, you might like feel embarrassed or guilty or even shameful about things that have happened in the past and staying in that state is only going to make things worse because you'll be focused on things that you don't want that feeling of guilt or whatever it is or the mistakes I don't want to make a mistake I don't want to make a mistake the workshop that Alan did on Monday about like focus on what you do want I do want to take control of my finances I do want this bright future I do want whatever it is your life to be in retirement so the key here is just forgive past you for those mistakes. Say, look, I made mistakes. I didn't know or I was not in the right frame of mind or state to be able to cope with it. And now let's move forward. Focus on what I can control. Focus on what I do want. Start making that positive trajectory, that positive trend to improving your finances and your life in any area of your life. So it's not about beating yourself up. You are hereby resolved of any guilt in whatever, like who cares? Let's start from today and move forwards together. Isabel says I can have a fresh start. So Absolutely. I feel okay. Uh, let's go back to this. How many hours do I have to work for this? Like it's a simple sum you can do. Let's imagine you were buying a new PlayStation for your kids, for yourself, whatever it is. Uh, we looked up the cost today. Cost of one of these is £500 with a game and a controller. Um, what's your hourly wage? How much do you earn an hour? If you work in a shop, you might earn £10 an hour. Well, it'll take you 50 hours to buy one of these. Is it work one and a bit weeks of your life to be able to afford one of these? Are you willing to pay the price? If you are, great. If you aren't, stop. And I think sometimes looking at your spending in weeks and months of your life will change the way you look at it. And it really changed the way we look at spending as well. So that's that bit. Uh, the level piece for this, how to start playing this game. Level one, from next week, every time you go to buy something, ask, do I want this or my freedom? That's just the question. I would say for the next week. No, don't start next week. Start now. Start yeah, that's what today. I meant. Sorry. Yeah. For the next week, not start <laughs> the next week. Start today. Start, start now. Today. Yes. 
Uh, obviously, you need to buy groceries and eat so you don't have to ask, would I rather have freedom or food? That's not what we're talking mm. about. It's extra purchases. Yeah, extra purchases that you, you know, kind of know that you don't need or feel like you want to treat yourself. Maybe treat yourself by putting an extra £10 in your emergency fund and start seeing that grow and get the excitement from that. Level two is track how much you increase your gap by each month. The gap is what we use to buy our freedom and we're coming on to how. So level two is tracking that gap. And level three, this is my favourite one. I challenge you all to do this one and send me a video of you doing it. Uh, please go into a BMW dealership, look at the cars, and then when you're stood next to the dealer, scream, I don't want these, I want my freedom! And then charge out of the BMW dealership. That would make me laugh so much. And I think I'm going to do it in the next time I go. Andy says he's not going to do that. Uh, it's definitely outside the comfort zone, <laughs> Andy. Um, but just focus on buying your freedom, not stuff. Uh, <laughs> Andy, maybe do it in a Starbucks instead. I'm not paying that for a coffee. I want my freedom and then charge out. So let's move on to uh, rule seven. Katie, tell us about rule seven. This is avoid lifestyle inflation. What does lifestyle inflation mean? Well, it's kind of keeping up with the Joneses. Every time that you earn a little bit more, generally what happens is people increase their spending to meet that earnings. And the game here with getting ahead is not doing that, is keeping that gap between what you earn and what you spend and not bringing up the spending to meet how much you're earning. And I love this quote from Fight Club. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have. We're going into debt to impress people we don't even like. Why are you doing this? Like, you don't need to do it. You don't need to keep up with the next car, with the next upgrade on the house, with the new kitchen, with whatever it is. You don't need to do that. And the way to get ahead is to avoid that at all costs. Lifestyle inflation basically means increasing your spending every time you get a pay rise. And that's pretty much what everyone does. So we're going to draw one of Alan's quick diagrams, which is obviously uh, highly accurate. I do enjoy your accurate diagrams. Thank you. So the idea is that we're going to look a lot along time. So you can see at the bottom there, we've put like your ages, your 20s, your 30s, your 40s. When you're in your 20s, you're not earning as much. Maybe you've got, you know, you're just starting out your career or you whatever job you're doing. And then you... So your you're, spending is kind of like similar to what you've got coming in in your 20s. And then maybe actually you get pay rise in your 30s. So your wages go up. But what does everyone do as soon as their wages go up? Oh, I'll buy and, a BMW. Uh, or you'll buy a personalised number plate because you deserve it because your wages get up. I don't know anyone who does that. I actually feel quite guilty about that. You know, like The absolved... spending just goes up like this. I absolved you of any guilt. I know you did. I still feel guilty. <laughs> um, it just goes up to the same level. And then it happens again and again and again. In your 30s, you go, you get a family, the spending goes up to the next level to match the income. And basically, that's what people go through over years and years and years, that their spending just increases in line with what they're doing. So the key is not to do that. It's to Legit avoid it. I mean, yes, like increase your spending a little bit if you want to and start to have a few more bits that you want like we're not saying don't have any joy from any of this we're just saying like think about that gap and what you want to do with it and not just to automatically increase your spending just because you're earning more but to do it consciously if you want to do that great but just know the cost that you're not going to be able to get ahead and to be able to buy your freedom we don't get particular joy from fancy jewellery or clothing so we don't spend money on it we spend money on travel which does give us joy and actually that brings us on to one of those reasons i don't know if you saw right at the start we said about high tax rate uh spe like people in the higher tax rate back it they buy bigger liabilities so the more money they earn 
the bigger the liabilities they buy. They buy nicer cars, they buy bigger houses, they buy more stuff, and that's actually what causes them a problem. And Katie and I have this thing, whenever we see someone with a fancy car, we kind of look at each other and go, they'll never reach financial independence uh, because the cars are normally financed. Um, and it was fascinating. We were in Korea last year and they had an actual term for this. They called people car poor and they were incredibly poor. They didn't have a house, but they had a really expensive car. And it's like people just trap themselves with the car. Well, I don't think they even have the car, do they? It's on debt, isn't well, it's, it? Like it's owned it's by the... Payments. Yeah, exactly. Like they don't, they just want to appear wealthy. And we're going to come onto that one in one of the later rules as well. So what we do is rent for a week. So if we ever want a nice car, we rent it. Uh, and then we go back to driving our other car. So this was me. I rented a Ford one F-150 for like a week in America. And I had a wonderful week. And then I went back to driving my small car that was very fuel efficient. So you can rent stuff if you really want to have the experience. So how are we going to implement this? So this rule, if you remember, is to avoid lifestyle inflation. So rule number one is first of all, actually like, to avoid lifestyle inflation, you need to have increased your income first to not do the lifestyle inflation. So come on the salary track workshop, which is, I forget when, but I think next week, we're going to teach you all about how to increase your income and then how to keep more of the money that you have coming in. Level two, every time you get a pay rise, pretend it doesn't exist and put it straight into paying off the debt and investing in the future. Pretend like you didn't even get the pay rise. Celebrate by having a glass of water and a dance around the flat with some music and then invest it. And finally, level three, like if you want these experiences, don't buy the thing, just borrow it or rent it for the day or find the friend with the boat that you can go and have the fun time on the water. You don't need to buy these things. You can just rent it for the day, for the week or whatever. Which brings us on to rule number eight, buy assets. But first off, we have to like figure out what is an asset and what is a liability. And there's a definition that accountants will use that scares us off. And there is a definition that we use that we find a lot easier. Katie, what is the Donegan definition of an asset? An asset puts money in your pocket and a liability takes money out of your pocket. It costs you every month, every year, whatever. An asset puts money in your pocket, a liability takes money out of your pocket. So we have a quick game, uh, which is asset or liability. Please put it in the chat, send us a message and tell us which one you think. Is your car an asset? Is your car an asset? Uh, do you think your car is an asset? Does it put money in your pocket? Or does it take money out of your pocket? MC says no. Alexandra says no. Anne says liability, yeah. liability. Eric no. says liability. Zoe, so, Sarah, Isabel all say liability. Yeah. This game, don't they? I love it. If you used it to do Uber driving and were making money from it, maybe it's an asset, but it's a liability. Every month it takes money out of your pocket. Every single month. Uh, and the bigger the liability you buy, the more fancy the car is, the more money it takes out of your pocket. Are stocks and shares an asset? What are stocks? That just means ownership of a company. You own part of the company. Is that an asset or a liability? Uh, the McFlip say yes. Anne says it's an asset. Davinda says asset, asset. Uh, truly says asset. Yes, for us, they're an asset. This is basically what we spent all of our money on was an index fund of stocks and shares that grew over the years and allowed us to be financially independent. Daniel says, what if they decrease in value? Uh, they will, but they always go up over the long run. So they do go down, but they always go up over the long run if you buy a broad-based index fund, which if you don't know what that means, Rebel Finance School will help you with everything to do with that. So stocks are definitely an asset. Moving on, how about the home you live in? This is the controversial one that got us into a lot of trouble in Devon. Uh, is your house, the home you live in, the one you're sat in right now, an asset? Liability, says Milan. 
liability. Sarah says liability. NL says asset. MSA says no, it's not an asset. Anne says it's an asset. Lanu says home is liability. So let's let's come back to the definition. Does the home that you live in, does it put money in your pocket or does it take money out of your pocket each month? That's the key. Like, is it stripping money out of your pocket or is it putting your money in your pocket? Maybe if you did, my mum always used to threaten to rent my room out uh, to someone else and take advantage of the uh, tax allowance on renting a room out. If you're renting out a room in your house, it might actually bring bringing in money. But for most people, it costs you money, mortgage, insurance, uh, utilities, like money just vanishes. And yes, you would still have to rent a home if you didn't have a home because you have to have somewhere to live. But you just need to see it as something that is actually taking money away from you. And we're not saying it doesn't have any value. Of course, it has value. We're just trying to encourage you and challenge you to think about these things differently. Like it's not something that's going to look after you in retirement and provide you with an income. And you'll be able to live in it. You can live but... in it, of course, but it's not something that's going to give you money that you can live off. And that's what we're thinking about. We're not saying it doesn't have value. We're not saying don't buy a home. We're just saying start thinking about these things differently. And that's the key bit. If you think like everyone else, you will get the same results as everyone else. And we've seen what the results are of the average person in the UK with their finances. If you want different results, think differently. It will change everything. Um, I wanted to uh, pick up a comment Daniel said in the chat, technically a liability, but better than renting. Well, not necessarily as well. Like there's if you do the maths, then maybe it is actually financially better to rent. And it will be different in different areas of the country, in different areas of the world. And again, we're not anti-home. We're not anti-home buying. We're pro doing the sums and understanding the impact. And maybe you work out that actually it is better to rent in terms of the money side of things. But emotion, there's always an emotional side to things as well, of course. Like maybe you want to own your own home to have that feeling of safety or security or that that's your own place or whatever it is. So it's, it's just acknowledging that and knowing that it's not necessarily better financially, but regardless of that, you are going in with your eyes open and saying, yes, it's better to buy it even though I prefer to buy it, even though I know it costs a little bit more than renting. Yes, Donegans are not anti-property. We are pro-maths and we're pro-making <laughs> conscious decisions. So we're going to move on quickly. The next one, is wine an asset? I think I spotted Anne having a sip of a glass of wine a minute ago. <laughs> uh, is wine an asset? Does it bring you cash? <laughs> Anne says it's a necessity. <laughs> tell you what this is an advert from my instagram feed they were trying to get me to invest in wine wine doesn't put you money in your pocket like it's speculation you gamble that it goes up over time it's the same i get so many of these adverts now whiskey is whiskey an advert asset like this simple investing place, are you looking for a fixed rate return opportunity in the whiskey sector? Has secure high percent returns. It's just ridiculous. It's not an asset. It just sits there and we're gambling it goes up. So you need to be careful with that. Ellie says not unless you own a vineyard. Yeah, if you own a vineyard and a business, then you own an actual asset that makes you money. Uh, the final one, are jewellery and gold assets? Does gold put money in your pocket? Or does it just sit there on the side? And basically what people do is they buy gold and they hope that it goes up in value. But it's not an asset. It doesn't bring you an income. It just doesn't. Property can be an asset if you rent it out. Businesses are an asset. Stocks and shares are an asset. They actually bring in money. So I have a question for you all. We've got a quick poll. Do you own any assets? Do you own any assets? So we've got a poll for you. Please vote on that. If you're watching on YouTube, use the QR code, scan that. Please tell us, uh, do you own any assets? Um, and it's an interesting one as well. If you have a workplace pension, you probably own some assets. Whether or not you've optimized them is a whole nother thing. So in the chat, you have a link to the Google form if you're watching on YouTube as well. Uh, Kelly says she doesn't own any assets yet. 
Uh, is a business an asset? Yes, if you own it and it's working for you, a business is an asset and it brings in money. Um, so that's the question. At the moment, we got 77 people, 77% of people saying yes, 23% saying no. So the 23% who said no, you don't own any assets yet. This is going to be your mission is to start to work towards owning assets because that is so important. Anne says, is a buy to BTW, buy to... Is that a typo? Is that buy to let? If BTL yeah, flat? Yeah, please nodding. If, yeah. It, if, it, if it puts money in your pocket, yes. Some people have flats that they rent out and it actually costs them money each month. So I would term that a liability because um, a lot of people are... are betting or gambling on the property going up over time, which maybe it will, maybe it won't. But if it puts money in your pocket, then yes, I consider that an asset. Yes. Uh, so the key question with any buy to let property is, do you know the percentage return? Um, we can work out how to do that another day, but like how much is it actually bringing in each month as a percentage of your equity? So we're going to move on to the next little bit, which is how to actually do this. Level one, understand the difference between an asset and a liability. We've got a video that goes through that in a little bit more detail. But level one is just understanding, are you spending your money on assets or liabilities? Yeah, I think it's about a seven or nine minute video. So just to like consolidate and reinforce this idea. The next one would be to make a list of the assets and liabilities that you own, just to understand like what do you have? The bigger the liability, the bigger the emergency fund you have, i.e. the bigger the house, the more expensive the car, the bigger the emergency fund you need. And we'll come on to why that is in a second. And then finally, level three is to come on the Rebel Finance School and understand how to invest assets in a tax efficient way so that it works for you. That's level three is to get in the investing game. Rebel Finance School, for those of you that are not familiar, maybe you're new to our content, this is not an, a crazy upsell where we're like, here's some free information. Now, please come on our course and it costs you 300 million pounds. No, it's still absolutely free. This is something that we do because we are passionate about helping people. We're never going to charge you for anything. Um, yeah, come along to that. And if you're on the mailing list, you'll hear all about that and when we launch it and all that fun stuff. Exactly. And here's the video on assets versus liabilities. We'll put the link in the chat or you can scan the QR code uh, to be able to watch that short video on assets versus liabilities. Katie's putting it in the chat now. Let's move on to the next one. Rule number nine. If you need a liability, buy a small one. If you need a liability, buy a small one. That's the key rule here how do you do that and we're going straight to the details here because there's not much more to say than that just don't buy big liabilities uh, level one is list each liability you own and understand their true cost like how much money disappears each month from your world because of the maintenance the insurance the upkeep like actually understand the liabilities you have that's level one and then for each liability, ask yourself, like, is there a way I can downsize this to free up cash, to lower the monthly expense of it and to use that to buy my freedom? Because we do acknowledge that you need some liabilities in your life. <laughs> Depending where you live, you need a car, you need somewhere to live. We're not saying don't have any. We're just saying think about it and see if you can minimize the size of it and not automatically upgrade with that lifestyle inflation that you should avoid. We're saying Think about this consciously and not just try and keep increasing just to look good to your peers. And then level three, every time you come to make a big purchase, remember the expression, if I have to buy a liability, I should buy a small liability. Yes, boats, drones, cars are all liabilities. If you're going to buy one, buy a small one. So I'm curious to know what someone who is wealthy looks like what do they look like who are they where do they hang out what do they wear what do they dress like what do they drive what do they own can you describe put it in the chat someone who is wealthy yes a millionaire imagine a millionaire where does a millionaire live what do they look like what do they drive what do they buy where do they eat please put it in the chat i'm curious to know 
what a wealthy person looks like. Where yeah. do they live? Yeah, what do they drive? Me, says Ruth. <laughs> they look like you. I love that. Uh, Lewis says they look like Warren Buffett, which is interesting. Warren Buffett has lived in the same house for 50 or something years and drives a, a small car. Faye says, does Batman count? Batman is definitely a millionaire. <laughs> he drives unbelievable cars and houses. Eddie says, relaxed. Donna says, they look like us. I'm curious. Donna, I don't know what you look like. <laughs> Maybe you can put a photo in the chat. Uh, Anne says, someone who can choose whether to work or not. Oh, I like that. I like that. Angela says, a millionaire lives, drives, wears whatever they feel like. Pretty much a normal human. Mm. Sophia, acres of land, chef on site, private nanny, sometimes in <laughs> Range Rovers. They sometimes train others to create their dream life come by teaching others what they did. Interesting. Well, we don't have a nanny. That's definitely true. Uh, but it's fascinating when you look at this. How does a millionaire live and what do they do? I guess what we wanted to say to you is lots of people think millionaires have expensive things and lots of people working for them and all of that stuff. Uh, what we want to say to you is choose to be wealthy, not to look wealthy. Because many of the people we know that have what would be a millionaire lifestyle with nice cars and nice things don't actually have very much money. And then there's the two of us who go around in our Marvel T-shirts and... Uh, I'm DC today. You are DC today. And we kind of don't look wealthy, but we have that millionaire lifestyle and we are wealthy, but you don't have to look it. And they had a fantastic, uh, fascinating experience. We went to a family event a while ago and all of the other cars in the car park at the family event were very nice cars. There was Mercedes and Audis and all sorts of cars. And then we turned up in our Beatons up Skoda Citigo. Uh, and guess who had the highest net worth at the family event? It was not the Audi drivers. It was not the BMW drivers. And it's really interesting like compared with how people think a wealthy person should look and what they do look is often quite different. And if you're buying bigger cars, if you're buying bigger houses, you are buying bigger problems and bigger money holes, which will just, your money vanishes down there. And this is the key bit. We said right at the start, 69% of high earners went into debt over an emergency. Like why? This is why, because they buy bigger liabilities. They buy expensive cars that cost a lot to maintain. They buy expensive houses. They have all sorts of these things. And the studies have shown that an emergency costs about double if you're a higher rate earner. Mm. So they said an emergency for someone who's on a lower income is about 750 pounds. An emergency someone who's on a higher income is about 1,200 or 1,300 pounds, which I find crazy, but it, it makes complete sense. Higher earners, emergency costs, they're almost double. So that's why people who spend more end up in even bigger pickles. So most people don't actually want money, they want stuff which we, we learned an incredible lesson. Um, I was actually running a, an event. We were in Portugal. It was an event about finances and we were in the hotel. Uh, and after the week of the event, I was sat on the roof of the hotel overlooking the valley. And the guy who'd made me coffee each morning at the hotel, he was lovely. Uh, he made me a coffee. We sat, we chatted. And I said to him, you've been so kind to us. Uh, is there anything I can do for you? And he looked at me with a cheeky uh, twinkle in his eye. And he said, what about if you gave me a million pounds? Because he knew we were running a finance conference. And I kind of laughed and paused and said, what would you do with the million pounds? If we gave you a million pounds, what would you do? It's an interesting question for you listening right now. If you got a million pounds, what would you do with it? Anne, Saloni, Isabel, Rachel, what would you do with a million pounds if you got it? And this young person looked at me and he said, well, first thing I'd do is get a new car. Second thing I'd do is get a house. 
Then I get a house for my parents. Then after I've got a house for my parents, I would uh, go on holiday. I take my friends on holiday and I kind of smiled at him and said, oh, so you don't actually want a million pounds. You want stuff. And it's really fascinating. Most people don't want money. They want things. They want stuff. And as soon as they get money, it disappears. And that's the key bit. If you want to be wealthy, you have to hold on to the money you get. And if you think about a million pounds and you think, well, I'd go on holiday with it. I'd do this with it. I'd do that with it. It would all disappear within a year. And Pete has put an interesting one. Pete said, I'd create a six month emergency fund, kill my debts, dump the rest in a Vanguard Global Index, sit back and let the market work for me. That is exactly what we would do, Pete. We would buy our freedom with that money and we would invest it so it creates a return so that we can live off it. Saloni says she would save it for her kids and by that mean invest it, which is phenomenal. If you invest it, that money will work for you and you will be able to live off it for years. If you spend it, it's gone in a flash and you will never see it again. And actually, that's why most lottery winners end up going bankrupt is because they spend all the money on liabilities and then can't afford to upkeep them. That's the key bit. Uh, Donna's put a hand up. Donna, we're going to do questions at the end, if that's OK. So we will come to you and we will do that. Um, so how are we going to implement this? OK, so level one for decide to uh, be wealthy rather than look wealthy is to make that decision and decide what is important to you. Do you want to look wealthy? Do you want all this stuff and the bling and the like dollar dollar bill? You're like, um, what am I talking about, Alan? The, I like, don't know. The jewelry. I'm not cool enough Obviously, to know that. Do you want to look wealthy or do you want to be wealthy? Maybe put in the chat. If you want to look wealthy, put an L. If you want to be wealthy, put a B for be wealthy. And then level two is decide and ask what you would actually do if you did win a million on the lottery. Would you spend it all or would you use it to buy your freedom? Because you're probably going to earn more money in your future and you need to have decided what you're going to do with that money. And then the final one is to have a strategy for investing instead of spending, because this is what it's all about, is are you going to spend the money and look wealthy or are you going to be wealthy and invest? So how do you do that? Well, we can't cover that all today. So, again, this is come on the Rebel Finance School, which is a full 10 week course. Or if you're keen to get going before that and you're actually ready to invest is to read this investor series that we made for you. It's a series of blog articles that take you through from the beginning. Awesome. Thankfully, most people have put B in the chat. They're in the right place, it. Alan. We've convinced them. Yes. And Lynn Nayer said, be wealthy so my assets will buy me bling. I love that. I am perfectly comfortable with people buying anything they want uh, from their cash flow, their income. I love that. So the key concept of the course is the only way to get wealthy is to keep and invest some of what you earn. That's it. You keep and invest of some of what you earn. And even if you go to the extreme of winning a huge amount of money, most people don't keep and invest any of it. They spend it and go into debt. So you have to keep some of what you earn and invest it. Which all comes back to this idea of the positive gap, which is keeping some of what you earn. You've got your uh, what you earn, what you spend. Let's keep that positive gap. So do you want to have money to be able to comfortably live? Well, that's what we have to do. Invest. We have to learn how to play the game of money. We have to learn how to invest and we have to take our money and invest it. These are our 10 rules of the money game that we've got for you today. There is so much more to it and we've got a couple of bits coming up. So please stay with us. Um, but rule number one was create a gap. Have a gap between income and expending. Two, have an emergency fund for those inevitable things that happen in life. Three, start small, start where you are and just make progress. You can always make things better. Track your money, know where it's going. Avoid debt like the plague, just get rid of it. You deserve freedom more than stuff. Exactly. We would rather have you being free than have lots of stuff. Uh, seven, avoid lifestyle inflation. Number eight, 
buy assets, not liabilities. And if you need to buy a liability, buy a teeny weeny insy weeny one. And then finally, number 10, choose to be wealthy, not to look wealthy. And then the key piece here uh, is what are you actually going to do about all of this? So what we would like you to do, please, is work out what three specific actions you are committing to take in the next week. That's what we want to know. And what I want you to do is write it down, write down in your notebook, in your phone, wherever you've been taking notes. I commit to whatever it is and some ideas for you here. Opening an emergency fund, putting a pound in it. Maybe you're going to work out how much you spent last month. Maybe you're going to measure your gap for the year so far. So it's the middle of February, late February. How much has your gap been for the year so far? We've got some other resources. Are you going to check those out? We've got the debt attack strategy video, the assets versus liabilities video. We've got the investing series. There's so much more that you can find that we want to help you with. Or are you just committing to coming to the uh, gap widening workshops, how to increase your income, uh, the side hustle one and the how to live large on less one. Maybe they'll give you some inspiration as well. So we'd like to know what are you committing to? Because a workshop without action is just time wasted. And we want this to be so valuable for you as well as for us. That's the key. So what are you actually committing to? please write it down in your notebook. If you would like to share it with us, please put it in the chat and we'll give you a few seconds to think about that and write it down because the act of writing it down makes it so much more concrete. And if you want us to hold you accountable, pop it in the Facebook group and tell the world, tell the group what it is you're committing to as well. That's a fantastic way to do it. Gail says, when are the gap widening workshops? Uh, we'll come on to that. Yes, we've got that uh, in the next slide. We're doing workshops each Monday and Thursday. There's five more to come. I love this. A couple of people have put in the chat. So Sophia says, I commit to arranging a monthly meeting with my partner. I'm going to think over my income and spending, and I'm going to keep working on thinking about how to create a higher income for the long term rather than the short term. I love That's that. That's fantastic. Uh, Hannah says, make an early repayment on my loan. Excellent. Update my finance tracking spreadsheet and commit some cash to the emergency fund. That is brilliant. I love this. Anne says, I commit to whittling down my debt and attending the gap widening workshops. I love it, Anne. We will be looking for your face on those <laughs> workshops. Definitely. Uh, right. We have one more question for you, which is a critical question. When we do these workshops, we have to work out if they work or not to show the funders whether it has worked or not. So please, if you didn't fill out any of the other polls, please do this one. How confident do you feel before the workshop in taking control of your money? And how confident do you feel after the workshop taking control of your money? There's a Google form, which we put the link in the chat please, please fill out before and afterwards. One is not very confident. Ten is very confident. And like, did things improve? Have you got some actions you can do? Do you feel like after this workshop, you feel more confident than before? Uh, so please fill that out. If there's one thing we need, this is it. It is so important. If, so important. If you're watching on Catch Up, that link will be in the description of the video. Please take five seconds to just click on that and tell us how you thought the workshop went for you. We just had one comment in the chat, which I really love saying, whilst watching your course, I've cancelled three subscriptions, saving me £600 this year. That's, That's phenomenal. <laughs> that is phenomenal. So actually doing it whilst we talk. Uh, so please fill out before and afterwards this means the world to us if you fill out this question. It really does. This is the one thing we need. Um, it costs us money in Zoom Zoom subscriptions, website subscriptions to put this lot on. And the wonderful Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead has helped us with that. Thank you, Saloni. Thank you, everyone, for helping us with that. That money has allowed us to be able to put these workshops on and do all of this stuff. So please fill out this one question for us. We really appreciate it. Uh, Katie, should we end the poll?
Uh, I'm going to leave it up for the few people that haven't filled it in yet. Okay, so if you haven't filled it in, please fill that in right now. Uh, we have an upcoming series. This is part of the Money Makeover series. So the next workshop we have got is on Monday. We have Living Large on a Small Budget. And this is one of those gap widening workshops that we're talking about. These are all on the upcoming Mondays and Thursdays. Uh, at 8 p.m. UK time every week. So Monday, live large on a small budget. The Thursday after that is the salary trap, how to boost your income. Then I am running Create a Side Hustle. So how to make money on the side. I've kind of become famous for helping people do that over the years. And I'm excited. I've been working hard on a new version of that for you. Uh, and then the following one will be how to rocket and retire rich and understand those workplace pensions. Like, what are these statements that you get in the page? You're like, I don't know what's going on here. We're going to help you understand these. Exactly. And then the final one is mastering spreadsheets and numbers with none other than Katie Donegan, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, the Donegan mailing list. If you want to hear about the next Rebel Finance School, scan the QR code join our mailing list and we'll send you an email about the course and when it comes out it'll probably be may the 13th is the starting day uh, so that is coming i would like to point out that i actually did balance that pineapple on my head that's not photoshopped in so i'm very proud of that these are real photos with real pineapples uh did you see last week's workshop uh, we did Manifesting Your Extraordinary Future. If you didn't see that, you can still catch that on YouTube. And then the closing message for you is, most people overestimate what they can do in a year. They set these huge goals and then they get disappointed because it doesn't happen in a year. And most people completely overestimate what they can do in a year. But by the same token, they underestimate what they can achieve in a decade. And what we want to say to you is finances is the long game. It is a completely long game. So I don't really care what age you are, whether you're 30, 40, 50, 60. It is the long game. If you're 60 years old, you still have like 23 years on average to live. You can improve your finances over that two and a half decades that you've got. So don't worry if it doesn't happen instantly. Keep taking action every single day. And that's the key piece. Start where you are and take action every single day. And those things will compound over time to get you where you want to be. Andy says, I'll be 60 in July. Andy, we should have a party for that, uh, maybe in a park with a glass of water and some celebration things. Sounds lovely, darling. And music, <laughs> who knows? Andy, tell us what type of party you want. But that's the key bit. It doesn't matter what age you are, what age you found finances at, where you're starting, you can improve it by going forward. So please just start where you are and keep going. And Andy put a wonderful comment. He just said, my best years are still ahead. We agree completely. Life just keeps getting better. So thank you for coming to the workshop. We've had a huge amount of fun with you. We are going to end the YouTube now and we're going to stay on Zoom and answer questions. If you're listening on YouTube live, Katie has just put the link to the Zoom in the chat. So if you want to come and ask us questions, feel free to come over to the Zoom and ask us questions. If you're in the Zoom, uh, we can answer your questions in a second. So YouTubers, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for being part of the Rebel Gang. You are awesome. We're going to end the stream now. And uh, goodbye, YouTube. We'll stop.